Station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, almost ready for the event. And I'm ready for the event. CG1, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Hello, I, I read you loud and clear. How about you? Buongiorno. Sì, ti sento forte e chiaro. Buongiorno, benvenuta a bordo della stazione spaziale. Benissimo. Allora, cominciamo con eh, poche domande. Eh, ecco, noi dal TG1 vorremmo sapere la passeggiata spaziale, l'emozione, ma anche the la emotions, seconda passeggiata spaziale, space il 16 luglio, on era July entrata 16th. acqua nel casco. Che cosa è successo? Water came into the helmet. What happened? Sì, due passeggiate, yes, devo dire, molto, walks, molto diverse. Very, very le, le, le attività extravehicolari sono estremamente eh, delle attività molto particolari che comportano del rischio. La prima, la prima del luglio, risk. è andata a bene, really well, senza problemi, senza, eh, eh, senza inconvenienti, per cui è un'attività extravehicolare da, da manuale. Was very, uh, eh, abbiamo completato tutte le attività, siamo anche so we completed all our activities and we even went beyond with some activities to start the second one right. However, the second one didn't go very well. I brought the helmet here with me to show you what happened on that day. This is my helmet. Yeah, explain to us what happened. Yes, this is my helmet, I was saying. This is the helmet I was wearing during the uh, spacewalk. On orbit, air to be able to circulate must be forced, so it must be ventilated constantly. From this hole here that you see underneath, maybe you can't see it very well, but there's, there's an entrance that brings the air from the vent loop into the helmet. The diffuser is this white part that you see inside the helmet. So air comes into this hole and then through the diffuser is distributed throughout the helmet so that it can constantly change the air. So we think that some water from the cooling loop somehow went into the vent loop and through this hole was transported throughout the throughout these diffusers behind the white part and little by little started accumulating behind my head because obviously on orbit water doesn't flow so it's simply accumulated in a huge bubble that after a while I felt also because its temperature was very low. The biggest problem was when as you can see the volume inside the helmet is not a lot so when the volume increased so that it would cover my eyes, nose and ears that's that was the worst moment of the whole activity. Your colleague Chris Cassidy said that the incident could have had some dire consequences. Were you afraid and will you be going out for a third spacewalk? Well, th those are two different questions. Let me answer the second one right away. Definitely, I hope to be able to have other extravehicular activities. Obviously, this is my dream and the dream of many astronauts, but at this time, we are busy with troubleshooting the spacesuit and the ones on the ground as well to see if it's a common problem. Once we have resolved this problem, then we will be thinking about 
other spacewalks. At this point, it's still too early to be able to understand whether that's, that's something that we can do during the synchromet or whether we need to wait till next time. As far as the emotions that I felt during the uh, those intense phases. It's very hard to describe because it's a lot of emotions all at once. Definitely, at a very basic level, there is fear. Because I always say that fear is an instrument. All your instruments can be used for positive or negative. A scalpel in a surgeon's hand can be an instrument of life, but it can also be used for to hurt people. So fear has the same value. You can utilize it to heighten your senses, to be able to think on your feet and react more quickly if, if it's used properly and if we're trained to do so. Fortunately, my training that I received on the ground and in many years in the uh, Italian Air Force as a pilot and then uh, a test pilot, that training was very useful to me because when I reacted to the emergency, I try to keep calm and to focus focus on what the uh, possible resolutions were and how to be able to go back even without uh, a lot of visibility. And I also try to think as fast as I could, if water had reached my mouth, how could I have eliminated it so that I didn't drown in the helmet? So talking about what happens on the International Space Station, do you have an idea from there of what's happening on Earth? What questions do you have for the Italians? Well, I'm always in contact with the Earth. Fortunately, technology helps us on board a station, and we have Internet on board the station, certainly not continuously. And also due to the fact that we're working for the majority of our day. But fortunately, we have the ability to connect and to be able to follow what's happening in Italy and in the world. Of course, I'm very interested in what's happening in Italy. A message for the Italians. I would like to say this to the Italians, to continue to believe in our nation, to continue to believe in our country. It's a little country, but it's a great nation. There is a lot that we can still do and demonstrate to the world that we still have capabilities and that we still have the will to work and to come back. And this is the time to look to the future and research and invest into the future and our youth. So to invest in them, to look to the uh, fields of expertise like engineering, science, physics, Look at these fields with anticipation and faith so that with optimism we can come out of a moment of crisis that is not just Italian, but it's, it's a worldwide crisis. So my message is just this, to, be, to have faith and to be optimistic. Have you received something from Italy with the latest spacecraft that came up, something that you had asked for? Or did you realize that there's something else that you wanted up there on station? The last progress spacecraft was a spacecraft containing materials for the station, not a lot of items for us astronauts. What we received was a surprise. I don't know if it came from Italy. I don't believe so, but we did receive some uh, fresh fruit and vegetable that here on station, it's an incredible luxury. It's, it's an explosion of colors and, and sense that we didn't expect. But honestly, aside from my family and my daughters, I don't really, I'm not really miss anything here on board. Last question. Do you communicate daily with your family? And what did your mom tell you after your spacewalk? 
Yes, fortunately, once again, thanks to technology, I have the opportunity to utilize a, an internet phone to be able to communicate with my family. Daily, I call my wife and I speak with my daughters. When, when I came back from the second extravehicular activity, I immediately called my wife, who had already spoken with my mom. And I tried to tell them simply that everything went fine, that I was fine, which was true, without trying to minimize any of the events, but also without exaggerating them, because it, it never makes any sense to exaggerate. So simply telling them that there was a malfunction, that I was back and I was fine. And both my mom and my my wife are, are very used to this kind of uh, phone call after many years as a pilot. Thank you, Luca. Grazie a voi, a presto. Thank you all. See you soon. And in the uh, second portion of the event, Luca, I would like to speak to you about uh, the experiments uh, you do on board Columbus. So, Luca, I understand you. With pleasure. Let me put this aside and I'll. I'm ready. Ready for the question. Okay, Lucas. So I understand you'll be uh, taking part in a really uh, cool experiment uh, that's called Energy with Mike Hopkins uh, in September. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Yeah, absolutely. The energy experiment that will start in September, uh, both with me and Mike Hopkins as subject, is um, uh, is assessing the energy requirement for astronauts, um, especially with the view of a, of a long duration mission. What we're trying to discover here is, or to assess, is how much energy exactly does an astronaut need to um, to go uh, on a long duration mission, for example, to the moon or to Mars. And the idea is that if we can determine the exact quantity, uh, then we can we can pack. Uh, the exact amount of food required, and that would, would be uh, an incredible advantage, both in terms of storage and in economical terms, of how much money we, uh, we would spend in order to, uh, to send it. And that also equates to how big the spacecraft needs to be. And so you're eating and drinking special things during this experiment. Can you tell a bit more about it? That is correct. I will be, uh, I will be eating a, a very, a very specific diet that is um, uh, contained in this container right here. So this is uh, food that it's uh, that it's been packed uh, already uh, on the ground. It's uh, very specific and and the the. The scientists know exactly uh, the energy content of each specific container. So by uh, when I eat this food, the, uh, the scientists will know exactly how much energy my intake is. And then uh, I, I'm going to be drinking a specific amount of water that, we, that uh, we let the, uh, the scientists know um, be, they, it will let the scientists calculate how much of the energy I am ex, I'm expending, and so they can they can create an equation where they have uh, an intake and, and an outtake of energy, and that, and thus come up with a very precise idea of what an astronaut need to leave on orbit. I understand also you'll be, um, you have been busy sharing your sleep pattern for an experiment called uh, circadian rhythm. What's this experiment about? Yes, circadian rhythm is a, is a very interesting experiment. Um, uh, the idea is that because on the space station we, uh, we do not have uh, a regular uh, uh, um, the, uh, the the alternance of night and day is not is not regular. It's not like on Earth where we have uh, basically 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night. Uh, here on the station, we we have uh, uh, 16 cycles a day uh, of night and day. So obviously, our sleep pattern is cannot be affected by those um, 
uh, by those patterns and, and we we go into a uh, an artificial uh, sleep pattern. So uh, this study has a sensor uh, permanently connected to me for 36 hours that measures my temperature and uh, the temperature is related to the activity of the body so uh, technically when we are working we have a higher temperature when we sleep we have a lower temperature and by uh, collecting this data uh, they are able to determine how my sleep patterns have been affected uh, by living in an environment that is completely alien to what the normal uh, human uh, normal human is uh, uh, is supposed to, uh, to, to, to be adapted to. And what can we learn from this experiment? Why, how can we use it uh, on Earth? Well, I can think of several, uh, several uh, studies uh, where the results will be, will be applicable. Uh, for example, there are, different, there are several different kinds of uh, areas of jobs that, uh, that have, that, that have um, a very strong impact on how a person is uh, sleep deprived or stressed. Uh, for example, do medical doctors uh, uh, or, or people that work in the police or pilots that have to uh, deal with jet lags and long, uh, long stretches where they cannot sleep. Well, uh, this study will allow uh, the creation of procedures uh, that, and uh, uh, that protect these people from over fatigue and from um, from situation where a mistake can be made that could have fatal consequences. So, uh, as you can see, um, the impact of this study, uh, even though it's a, it's a very it's a, it could be uh, it could feel like it's a very small study, but the impact is really big. And my last question, Luca, is we're seeing all the time kind of a ping-pong ball uh, bouncing on a screen behind you in the middle of uh, the Columbus Laboratory. Can you tell us a bit more about what that is? Okay, uh, you are going to have to ask the questions again. The question again, because I, I uh, you came in very broken. We're seeing some uh, kind of a ping pong ball bouncing on a screen uh, behind you in Columbus Laboratory. Just behind you, can you tell us a bit more what, what this is? Oh, of course. Uh, you mean this uh, screen in, in the background? So um, that machine is a, is, a, uh, is a sound machine, is a um, ult ultrasound machine, a very small ultrasound machine uh, as big as a laptop. We use it for several experiments. Right now, we, today, we set it up for, um, for an experiment called ocular health, where we do ultrasound of the ocular bulb to see how the lack of weight uh, affects the shape of the eye and our vision. But we also use it for another experiment called spinal ultrasound, where we analyze the changes that the, the weightlessness causes on the on the spine. Now, this specific experiment is is has very important ramification on the ground, where until now, in order to to uh, to have a, to diagnose uh, a problem on the spine, we need very expensive machines like MRIs or uh, or or or, uh, or scan, body scans. Well, thanks to the procedure that we are developing today on the space station on the ground through remote controlling, in the future we will be able to diagnose. Um, actually, more very very in the very near future, we will be able to diagnose uh, problems on the spine using just a very simple and portable ultrasound machine, just like the one you see behind me. And that is is, is going to be very important for uh, remote areas and places where those machines are just not available. Thank you very much, Luca. That concludes the second portion of the event. Keep up the good work and speak to you soon. Thank you, Jules. It was a pleasure talking to you as always, and I'll talk to you next time. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Houston Station, thank you very much for the support. Thank you, TG1 and ESA Station. We're now resuming operational audio communications. 